that remind us of the battles waged and won for our freedom. The first person from the private equity sector to sign the giving pledge, Mr. Rubenstein says he intends to give away all of his wealth while he is still around to enjoy what his generosity can accomplish. In his case, helping Americans become better informed citizens, a goal very near and dear to the campus of, and this community. He coined the term patriotic philanthropy to describe his distinctive approach to giving back to the country that made his great fortune possible. What a commendable goal. And a special thank you to you, Joseph Ellis, a good friend who was here on campus last fall for my presidential inauguration. Thanks to your advice and that of George Washington, who was channeling his spirit through, through you at the time, as I recall. I did okay, I think, in my first year, and I'm happy to hear any additional transmissions you may have picked up from the ghost of Washington uh, if you've been to Mount Vernon again recently. So for now, please help me welcome David Rubenstein, Joe Ellis, and Adam Goodhart, the director of the college's CV Star Center. Yes, let's give them a round of applause. I'm going to turn the program over to Adam, who will be moderating. Adam, thank you. Thank you, Sheila, and welcome everyone. Um, I am thrilled to be here with all of you at this happy, albeit bittersweet, because we have some fabulous seniors graduating this year, this uh, commencement season. And I'm also thrilled to welcome two of our country's leading lights in the field of American history, David Rubenstein and, and Joseph Ellis. Now, of course, um, although Sheila and I are both giving little introductions, um, they won't need much introduction for many of you, um, because this is definitely History Town USA um, here in Chestertown. This is a place where people read American history. They sort of, you know, trade history books back and forth like kids trading baseball cards, like, uh, you know, hey, I'll give you two Ron Chernos for this Joe Ellis. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure you know these, you know these folks. I'll keep it pretty, pretty brief. As, uh, as Sheila said, um, Mr. Rubenstein is the co-CEO of the Carlyle Group, one of the world's largest private equity firms. But the really unusual thing about him is that um, not that he made a great deal of money in business, although that's pretty great, um, but that he's also pledged to give most of it away and indeed has become a leader in American philanthropy um, and what he calls patriotic philanthropy, a commitment to preserve, protect, and enhance the nation's most precious sites and treasures, as well as to foster a broad public knowledge and understanding of American history and heritage. Now, you might say as well that what Mr. Rubenstein does is not just financial generosity, although he's very generous, but also a kind of intellectual leadership. So when you go to the National Archives, for instance, you walk in, and even before you see the Constitution of the United States, the Declaration of, of Independence, you go into a hall where you see Mr. Rubenstein's copy of the Magna Carta, a 13th century copy of the Magna Carta. And so here you are, and, and that document presented as the cornerstone of our charters of freedom redefines the entire experience of going to the National Archives and experiencing the Declaration and the Constitution, recontext, recontextualizes it with um, really a single, a single artifact, a single display. It's just an example of um, the impact that he's had on so many of America's greatest historic sites the Washington Monument, the Iwo Jima Memorial, Montpelier, Monticello, Mount Vernon, the list goes on and on. For the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes, Mr. Rubenstein is going to speak about patriotic philanthropy, and I'll then return briefly to this podium and formally introduce Dr. Ellis, who will join Mr. Rubenstein on stage for a short public conversation. So please join me in welcoming to Chestertown and Washington College, David Rubenstein. Thank you. How many people here are graduates of Washington College? I'm just curious. Oh, how many people are on the board of Washington College? How many people are donors to Washington College? How many people are professors? How many people think George Washington was our greatest founding father? Okay. So let me tell you how I came about to coin a phrase called patriotic philanthropy. It's a little bit convoluted. It wasn't as if I sat down and called up McKinsey and said, give me a way that I can give back to my country and give me a report in six months about what I can do. Like most things in life, it happened by serendipity. And let me explain this, the background. So I'm from Baltimore. I grew up uh, there. And uh, your last name is Rubenstein. You might think, 
grew up in a prosperous family, white collar family, father's a lawyer, a doctor, but that wasn't quite the case. My father uh, dropped out of high school in Baltimore and went into World War II. Um, he came back and at the age of 20 he married my mother who was 17. She dropped out of high school as well to get married and more than one year later I was born. Um, and uh, you know, all people who are Jewish aren't necessarily particularly well educated, let's say, and so my, my parents weren't well educated. My father worked in the post office his entire life, made about $7,000 a year. And so I knew growing up as the only child, if I was going to go anywhere, I had to sort of make it on my own. So I spent a lot of time trying to learn how to advance myself. And when I was six years old, I was allowed to get a library card in Baltimore, and you were allowed to take out 12 books a week. And so I got my 12 books every week, and I'd read them in a couple hours, and then I had to wait a whole week to get 12 more books. But I loved reading, and I loved trying to advance myself. And then when I was in the sixth grade, uh, an event that changed my life probably happened. Uh, President Kennedy gave the greatest inaugural address of the 20th century. All of you probably remember it. And in that speech, which was only 14 minutes long, he basically said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And so my teacher tried to explain how this uh, great speech, which, were, which was really poetry in prose form, it was really written by Ted Sorensen with, with President Kennedy's involvement, but it was a brilliant speech. And we went through it word by word, and it just stayed in the back of my mind. And ultimately, I said, what I want to do is give back to my country. And I, I realized that I didn't have a lot of money to give back, and so I would try to get good education and maybe be a lawyer, go into politics, go into government, and serve my country, as President Kennedy had sort of suggested. So I got a scholarship to go to Duke University. I was, it was not a basketball scholarship. Um, in fact, uh, I was the only person in Duke's history who got cut from an intramural basketball team with only, <laughs> only four other people on the team, um, which is hard to do. Um, I did well enough there to get a full scholarship to University of Chicago Law School. I, I didn't have a lot of money, and so I, the full scholarship was wonderful. Um, it said, send in your $50, you get the full scholarship, okay? And send in your $50, you reserve your housing. I said, okay, well, I didn't have an extra $50, so I sent the $50 into the housing department and said, uh, you know, figured that they would tell the law school I was showing up. Why would I need the housing if I was, you know, not going to go to law school? Sure enough, when I show up the first day of law school, here I am, David Rubenstein, full scholarship person. They said, well, you didn't send your $50, and that scholarship money went to somebody else. So, so I'm starting to cry. The blood is draining out, and I just, you know, what's going to happen in my legal career? Finally, after crying enough, they came back and said, okay, we found the money. We'll re reconfigure some money. You have it. So I've been so grateful I gave them $30 million in scholarship money to make up for it. So they're very happy. Um, I... I I wanted to go and practice law, and I wanted to go into government and basically serve my country. So what did I do after I graduated from law school? I went to work for the man who, worked, who wrote that speech by John Kennedy. And his name was Ted Sorensen. He was at a law firm in New York called Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Warren, and Garrison. I went there. After a couple years of working for him, I kind of said, well, I'm ready to go to the White House. I'm ready to help out. And I think everybody felt this guy would be good to get him out of the law firm. So um, they encouraged Ted Sorensen to find a job for me. And he got a job for me. He said, this man will be the next president of the United States. And I said, oh, great, okay, I'm going to be in the White House at a very young age. His name was Birch Bayh. He was running in 1976. Uh, he didn't get elected. I was his chief counsel at the age of 25, and 30 days after I joined his campaign, or joined his Senate staff, he was campaigning, uh, he dropped out. So I figured, uh-oh, I wasn't a great lawyer, and my political acting wasn't so good, so you know, where's my career going? And then, as may have happened to you, I got a call out of the blue uh, that I didn't anticipate and changed my life again. Uh, the call was, would you like to work for somebody else who's running for president? Who is this? Jimmy Carter. Isn't he the peanut farmer from Georgia? Yes. And okay, I'll take the interview. I had nothing else to do. So I got the, the interview. I got the job. I went down there in uh, the summer of 1976. Jimmy Carter was 33 points ahead of Gerald Ford. Uh, when I was finished with my work, Carter won by one point. So... <laughs> And then Carter said, like, what was your contribution? I was doing pretty well before you uh, carpetbaggers came down. But uh, nonetheless, uh, as we all have observed over many, many years, uh, White House staffs are filled with people who work in the campaign, not necessarily on the merit. So I got a job as the deputy domestic policy advisor to the President of the United States at the age of 27. I wasn't qualified, but no one else was qualified either, I thought, so I fit in. Uh, one of my jobs was to fight inflation. I got it to 19%. Very difficult to do that. No one else has done it since. Um, everybody told me what a bright, bright young man I was. They were going to hire me when I was, you know, ready to leave. Uh, we lost the election to Ronald Reagan. And um, all of a sudden, I uh, called all these people and said, okay, I'm ready to be hired. Nobody would call me back because when you're out of power in Washington, you're a dead man. Harry Truman said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. So after many, many months of looking for a job, somebody felt sorry for me at a law firm, and they hired me, and I started all over again at the bottom of the heap. 
And then I, two things changed my life again. One, I read that a man named Bill Simon, who was Secretary of the Treasury in the Ford administration, had bought a company called Gibson Greetings Cards. And he had put a million dollars of his own money in, and he made $80 million in two and a half years. And I read that, and I said, that's better than practicing law. So I went down the street to Bill Miller, who had been Secretary of Treasury in the, in the Carter administration, and said, why don't you do a buyout kind of firm like Bill Simon, and I'll do legal work for you. He didn't seem really that interested, so in the end, I decided to start my own buyout firm in Washington, D.C. It was the first buyout firm in Washington. It was financed by four investors, one of whom was Alex Brown, and uh, Truman Siemens firm uh, was one of the people that put up the money for it. Uh, we got $5 million. I had three other people who actually knew something about finance. I didn't have a finance background. We built it to a very large, uh, one of the largest private equity firms in the world. When I turned 54, um, I read that on average a person of my, you know, background would probably live another, you know, third of my life. I'd already lived roughly two-thirds of my actuarial life. I might have a third to go. And then Forbes had put out in their um, papers, in their uh, magazine, what my net worth was. And so I read that net worth, which, and I kind of said, okay, I can't possibly spend this much money myself uh, and the rest of my one-third left to go. And I, um, I don't think my children really um, need it. They didn't necessarily agree, perhaps, but... Um, <laughs> So I you know, had observed that very few children who inherit staggering sums of money go on to win Nobel Prizes or something. You know, people who are doing great things in the world probably are not uh, having a $500 million or a billion dollar bank account. So I concluded that I would basically give my kids a very good education and try to let them uh, do what they could on their own. So I had a lot of money to give away, and I didn't want to necessarily wait till I died to have it be given away because I figured I wouldn't necessarily be in a place where I could observe where it was given away. And I didn't want to be buried with the wealth, like the ancient pharaohs are buried with the wealth, but there's no evidence you need it in the afterlife. So I decided I would try to give it away, and I became, as you heard, uh, one of the first 40 people to sign the giving pledge, the only person in the private equity world that did it. And then I began to kind of give away money to places that have been good to me, uh, my, my alma mater, Duke University, or University of Chicago where I went to law school, or medical research, and many things that people who have money uh, do, medical research, education, and scholarships, and so forth. And then um, my life was changed again by something that I didn't anticipate. I was reading about an, an, uh, a viewing at Sotheby's of, of something called the Magna Carta. And I was coming back from London. I said, how can it be in, in New York? I'm flying back from London to New York, and the, the Magna Carta's in London. What's it doing in New York? But I was intrigued. I went to see it at that night at Sotheby's. And they told me that there actually are 17 extant copies of the Magna Carta from different versions, 1215, 12. Uh, 16, 1217, 1224, and actually 1297, the only one that went into effect. Uh, the others were kind of abrogated, more or less. And um, there, there were, of these 17 copies, 15 are in British institutions, uh, churches and, and libraries and government uh, facilities, and one is in the Australian Parliament, and one was owned in private hands for 500 years uh, by a British family. They went land poor. Ross Perot came over and bought it. Uh, he sent his lawyer over, Tom Luce. He bought it for, in 1984 for about a million and a half dollars. He rolled it up in a tube. He took it through British Customs. They said, what's in that tube? They said, Magna Carta. They said, oh, sure, go ahead and go through. <laughs> um, so um, he put it on display at the National Archives, but he decided to put it up for sale. And the curator told me it would likely be uh, sold to somebody, one or two buyers who were not from the United States. And I knew enough about history to realize that the Magna Carta was the inspiration for the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution. And may, in many ways, was more important in our country's history than the British history. Uh, because when our colonies were set up, um, and Joe Ellis knows this quite well, uh, the, the charters were often um, said, you have the rights of Englishmen. And later the, the colony, colonists said, well, we have the rights of Englishmen, we have the rights of the Magna Carta. And so when we were being taxed without representation, they thought that we were being, we were, our right, rights were being violated from the, uh, the protections that we would have otherwise had from the Magna Carta. So I decided, uh, when I heard this story, to just to buy it the next night. Now, I didn't want to tell my wife, it sounds presumptuous to say, I'm going to go buy the Magna Carta tomorrow. And I didn't tell my children, they might say, how much less money might this mean for us? So I <laughs> simply uh, went back and toured my schedule, got back the next night, and I went in. I'm not an art collector, so I didn't really know much about Sotheby's. And I, I went in, and, uh, and they put me in a little room. They closed the door and they put up a telephone. And you get, you know, if you've ever been to an auction, you get carried away. And eventually, I get carried away, and I started bidding, and eventually, they said, sold. So I didn't, couldn't hear whether I bought it or somebody else bought it. They came in, they said, uh, who are you? Uh, and my, uh, you have the money for this? Yes. Okay, well, then you won. Um, and we have 100 reporters out there who want to know who bought it, but you can slip out the side door and nobody will know. And I said, no, I'm happy to tell the reporters that what I'm going to do is uh, put it on a long-term loan to the National Archives, and upon my death, it will go there permanently, and it's a down payment on my obligation to give back to my country. 
because I came from very modest roots um, and uh, be able to rise up in a country and do what I've been able to do may not have been able to happen in other countries, particularly with my last name. So I want to begin to pay back the country. And then I began to um, you know, buy other historic documents, uh, the Declaration of Independence, the Emancipation Proclamation, the, tr the 13th Amendment, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and put them on display in places in museums and, and uh, facilities around Washington, other cities, so that young people particularly could go there and see these documents and then maybe be inspired to learn more about American history and if they can, maybe become better citizens. Our theory is, at least my theory is, if you're more informed, you're a better citizen. It's sadly the case that many people know so little about our country's history. In a recent Pew survey, it turned out that 35% of Americans, when asked what river did George Washington cross during the Revolutionary War, said the Rhine River, which is not in our country. <laughs> when asked what is, who is the first Treasury Secretary, 30% of Americans said Larry Summers, which is not the case. Um, in a survey of high school sophomores by Pew, it turned out that more high school sophomores could name the first three names of the three stooges than the first three names of any founding fathers. It's not a good thing. So I began to think, uh, it, you know, obviously everything can be digitized and you can read things in books, but if you go to these museums and you can actually see these documents, maybe you'll be more inspired than if you just saw it on, on an internet screen. And so that was why I tried to buy these documents and put them on display, like the Emancipation Proclamation. I lent it to the White House. It was in the Oval Office for a long time. And every time President Obama would show people around his Oval Office, he would talk about the Emancipation Proclamation. Another thing happened along the same lines. I'm a chairman of the Kennedy Center, which is a performing arts center in Washington. And on the board, as an ex officio, as the head of the Park Service. When I was out of town one time, there was an earthquake in Washington. And the Washington Monument had some damage. So I said to the head of the Park Service, how much will it cost to fix it? And he said he didn't know yet. And I said, tell you what, I'll put up all the money. Just get it done quickly. Forget Congress. It'll take forever to get it done and so forth. He said, well, OK, fine, great. And he told me what it would cost. And I said, OK. He later told me about two weeks later that is a problem. The Congress doesn't feel they get credit for doing anything. So could they put up half the money? I said, oh, fine, OK. <laughs> so. Um, the Washington Monument, as you all know, and you're all Washington uh, fans you all, and, and, and scholars, you all know the Washington Monument wasn't really built uh, for quite a while. It's typical of our country. Uh, when our presidents die, we often take a long time to build monuments. So Washington died in 1799. This monument opened really about 1888 or 1887 or so. Um, Thomas Jefferson died in uh, 1826. The monument opens around 1943. Uh, Abraham Lincoln dies in, in 1865. The monument opens in 1922. In Washington's case, because the, uh, there were some political problems that Joe and I can talk about later at the time, uh, they didn't really build a, a serious monument to a while. Later, around the 100th anniversary of his birth, they decided around 1833 to actually begin a serious uh, monument. And they had a contest, and they built this. Uh, the contest winner was Robert Mills, who was the head of the uh, um, public buildings in Washington. And it was supposed to be a big colonnade with an obelisk. And as they started building it with private sector funds only, uh, they ran out of money around you know, 1840s or so. And so ultimately, um, they, they stopped building it. The Civil War ultimately broke out. And then they didn't finish it until after the Civil War. So it's a typical Washington project that took forever to get done. Uh, when, they, when the scaffolding was up to fix it, they asked if I would like to climb up and uh, be at the top of it. I said, OK. But they said, you don't have to really climb. There's an elevator. I said, OK. So I got there, and uh, the Secretary of Interior was there. She said she would be humiliated to take the elevator up. She's a mountain climber. And we, we should climb up. And I said, well, I wouldn't be humiliated to climb up. Okay. She said, I'm a, mount, I'm a mountain climber. I've climbed Mount Rainier seven times. I said, well, I've flown over Mount Rainier seven times. So I said, OK, I'll climb up if there's a defibrillator somewhere. And they found one. And we climbed up. And I got to the very top. It's 555 and a half feet. And the reason that's that tall is because ancient Egyptians figured out an obelisk will fall over if it's more than 10 times the size of the base. The base was 55 feet. So they went up 555 and a half feet. I got to the very top. And uh, I took out my pen when nobody's looking, and I wrote um, DMR. So if you ever get to the top of the Washington Monument, you'll see my initials. And so after I did that, I began to realize there were other monuments that weren't kind of falling apart because of earthquake damage, but that maybe they could be made better if people would, uh, if, if some resources were given to them. So I visited Monticello and decided I would put up some money to fix it up, provided that they built out the slave quarters. Because while Thomas Jefferson was a great man in many ways, he was a slave owner, and I thought people should see that. The same with Montpelier, the James Madison's house. The same with the Custis Lee Mansion at the top of Arlington Cemetery. In honor of my father, who was a Marine in World War II, I uh, did something with the Iwo Jima Memorial. Um, recently, the Lincoln Memorial, I thought, was falling down, or re re in weak sh shape, I should say, not falling down. Weak shape, needed some restoration, and also had no educational facilities for young people about Lincoln, so we will build an underground education facility there. And then recently, President Obama announced that I was involved in helping to restore 
the, um, the, the house on Capitol Hill that was the, ha the base for the suffragettes when they were lobbying Congress for the right to vote. And I've tried to do things like this to fix up these places so that Americans will have a chance to visit them and be more in, uh, interested in seeing them. If they're more interested in seeing them, maybe they'll be more informed about history. If they're more informed about history, maybe they'll be better citizens. If they're better citizens, maybe they'll have a better democracy. You know, as I was saying to Joe earlier, it is a strange situation. We had three million Americans in our country. We had um, half a million slaves in 1776. So we had two and a half million whites. And of those whites, half of them were not allowed to participate in government. So you had one and a quarter million whites who could participate in government. Out of that, we got George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, and so forth, James Madison. Now we have 320 million Americans, and we have, well, we have less than those people. <laughs> um, so um, my theory about giving back, all philanthropy is, is patriotic. If you're giving back to your, you know, you're in a philanthropic way, you're, you're doing something patriotic. Uh, Philanthropy is an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. It doesn't mean rich people writing checks. It means helping with your time, your energy, your ideas. And so I tell everybody, you don't need to be very wealthy to be philanthropic. Do give your time, your energy, your ideas, and if you have money, give that too. I have a theory that people live longer if they're philanthropists. And I try to inspire people to live longer by being a philanthropist. You know, rich people who are giving away money, they live longer. John D. Rockefeller lived in 97. David Rockefeller is now 101. So now I can't prove this, but I say, why would you want to take a chance that I'm wrong? So, <laughs> patriotic philanthropy is a phrase I coined really only to mean one thing. It's designed to be uh, not any more patriotic, honestly, than giving to your hospital or to your, or to your, to your school or your library. It's really designed to say there are certain types of things we should do to remind Americans of their history, the good and the bad. And if we can uh, remind people of our history, and particularly the young people, and they might be more informed citizens. We actually can have the kind of democracy that all of us want to have, where we have informed citizens, they make intelligent decisions, we get good people to run for office, good people to serve in office. And so that's what I've been trying to do with my, my little thing called patriotic philanthropy. But I don't have enough resources or time or energy to do it all, and I'm 66 years old, so I obviously I don't have an infinite amount of time to do this. So I'm trying to inspire other people to do the same thing, and shortly I'm going to have all the people who signed the Giving Pledge come to Washington, and I'll have seminars for them on patriotic philanthropy by people who run you know, things like the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian and the National Park Service and other places where people can give their money, perhaps, or their time, or energy ideas, but certainly their money, and maybe do some other things along the lines of what I'm doing. So that's what patriotic philanthropy is all about, and I'm happy to take any questions that Joe might have. All right, thank you very much. David, thank you so much, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your conversation with Joe Ellis. Um, Joe is somebody um, I knew when I was a pup, so it's especially exciting for me to welcome him back to Washington College. I was working for a magazine that he wrote for quite a bit, in fact, um, wrote the original essay that was the nucleus of his great book, American Sphinx, and my job was actually to poke holes in Joe's work. I was a magazine fact checker, and despite this, he was very nice to me, this um, little 23-year-old who knew much less than he did. And um, when I was supposed to be poking holes in his stories, there weren't many holes to, to poke, so we'd end up in long conversations on the phone. And uh, he taught me a lot, so I'm very glad to have him here. Um, as uh, many of you know, I'm sure, he's one of our, our great um, writers on American history, interpreters of American history. He's the winner of a Pulitzer Prize. He's the winner of a national book award, um, and many of you, I'm sure, are especially aware of his book, His Excellency George Washington, published in 2005, um, which, of course, is especially admired here at Washington College. His newest book is The Quartet, Orchestrating the Second American Revolution, 1783 to 1789, and that was published by Random House in 2015. Joe recently retired from his endowed chair as Ford Foundation Professor at Mount Holyoke College, um, which I suspect means that there may be even more books following in rapid <laughs> succession. Certainly, I, I hope so. Um, to me, one of the remarkable things about Joseph Ellis's prose is not just that it's so elegant, um, not just that it has such intellectual acuity, but also that it has a sort of a, a psychological depth to it, a deep understanding of what makes human beings tick, which is unfortunately something that's missing from so much history published these days. 
For Joseph Ellis, history isn't a series of pie charts and bar graphs and statistical generalizations, but rather it's a very human story, sometimes one of jealousy, ambition, and hypocrisy, but especially in his Chronicles of the Founding Fathers, it's about people whose vision and leadership overcame that much to the benefit of their generation and ours. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome him, and I hope you are as well, um, and that you'll join me in welcoming him. <clears throat> David interviewed me back in the fall when my book came out, and, so, and he was extremely gracious, um, and I promised him I would try to be equally so, um, and that's pretty easy, given who he is. Question. Did you really write your initials into the top of the Washington Monument? Is that a true story, or is that an exaggerated story? Well, it's apocryphal. Ah, I thought so. You just told it, and I thought it was true. Well, here's what happened. Okay. I was asked if I wanted to do that mm. by the head of the Park Service. They said that there's a piece of aluminum up there when, they, when it was built, there was a piece of aluminum, which was very valuable then. And they said, would you like to indent and put something there? And so I did put a little indentation on it, but I don't know if anybody can really read it. And so did the others, I think. Okay. Because, you know, one of the distinguishing features about the Washington Monument, other than the fact that you helped save it so that it wasn't going to fall down, is there, if you, you know, if you go to the Lincoln Memorial, it's four score and seven. If you go to the Jefferson Memorial, it's we hold these truths. If you go to the Martin Luther King, it's, I have a dream. There are no words on the Washington Memorial. Um, and it's almost like he's the guy that can keep his mouth shut. And um, we can, and, but that you would have ruined everything if you put your words on the well, top of that I, 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 I don't think I ruined it. But inside, as you know, there are things, each of the states put blocks Quite, but, yeah, and said things. Right. Right. And there's there. graffiti in there, too. There is. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, at the Lincoln Memorial, I was under there recently, and uh, underground, we're going to build an education center. And you go down there where they built underground the Lincoln Memorial, there is the original graffiti from the early part of the century really? when they were building it. And graffiti then is, then was pretty much like graffiti now. As you look back, what's the most challenging and perhaps more importantly, the most fun for you? Making money or giving it away? Well, that's uh, very easy. Um, making money is not um, that difficult. A lot of people do it, and a lot of people aren't all that talented to do it. I'm probably one of them. <laughs> um, I don't think it takes an enormous amount of brilliance to make money. You see a lot of people who are not all that smart making a lot of money. So plenty of people can make the money, and a lot of people can give away the money. I think giving away the money intelligently and enjoying it is mm. more pleasurable. So you can always write checks, and people will infinitely come up to you and say, give me money for this. You can fill up your whole day just giving away your money. But I think the way, better way to do it is to um, be involved, know what you're doing, have some follow through, have some metrics so you can see whether money is actually doing something good. I mean, you can give more money to it. So um, giving away is, uh, is more pleasurable. I, a story that I, I think is not apocryphal, it is true, is this. Uh, when I was building Carlisle and made it into one of the larger private equity firms in the world with my partners, uh, my mother was proud. I mean, she, you know, some very modest means, and she was proud, but she didn't quite understand probably everything I was really doing to build the company. But as my net worth kept getting reported in papers and so forth, you know, she never called me anything, said, that's great, you're now worth X, you're now worth Z, <laughs> and whatever. She never said that. Uh, when I started giving away money, she would call me regularly and say, hey, you're doing something good. Finally, you're actually figuring uh -huh. out what to do with it. So I used what I call the mother test. If your mother calls you and says you're doing something good, that's the real kind <laughs> of, 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 you know, actually being doing something useful on, this, on, the earth, on, the, on the face of the earth. Why do you think that in the United States versus, say, Europe, philanthropy is so much more yes. important than bigger? Why, why does the United States have a philanthropic tradition that you're now making a yes. major contribution to? But it goes back to, you know, I, mean, well, I guess Carnegie and before Carnegie. I mean, I don't know before yes. that. Well, uh, what happened was in, in, in Europe, the, um, the governments in Europe paid for things. They paid for the schools, or the mm. churches did. They paid for the libraries. They paid for the museums. They paid for the symphonies. They paid for the operas. When our country was started, it was a poor country. There was no big government to fund things. So as the Tocqueville pointed out when he came over, 
uh, there's a lot of volunteer associations in the United States. Everybody's volunteering for things. Mm. And so when, when Benjamin Franklin wanted to build a, a library a company, he would go and get the people to contribute to it. And so we had this tradition from the beginning of the country of people pulling together to make the country better because we didn't have a big, rich government that could help. Uh, this tradition has continued. Uh, we, are, we give away per capita more than any other country by far in the world, probably about 2% or so of GDP, mm. which is twice what almost any other country in the world gives away. When Bill Gates and Melinda Gates and Warren Buffett conceived the giving pledge, which says you're going to give away 50% of your, your net worth upon your uh, death or during your lifetime, uh, the original idea was to have similar groups in Europe and, and Latin America and Asia and so forth, uh, but they quickly realized that nobody around the rest of the world would do this. So uh, we now have about 150 people have signed, but maybe 15 or 20 are from outside the United States, and the rest are from the United States. And, and there are actually now more billionaires in China than there are in the United States, but there's virtually nobody in China that signed this because giving away that much money is just not part of their tradition. People always say they want to pass it along. I think maybe the tax deduction... Pass it along to their own heirs. To pass it along to their own heirs. Mm -hmm. I mean, and uh, many countries don't have estate taxes, so there's not quite the incentive to give it away. Mm -hmm. And we do have a, a tax deduction in the United States, which probably incents some people to give away. I think the wealthiest people give it away because what else are you going to do with it? There's no evidence you can really just, you know, give it to your heirs if you have this gigantic sum. So I do think that um, the tax system is part of it, but I think our tradition of being a more philanthropic nation is part of it. But I want to point out, though, while we give away uh, about 2% of GDP, about 40% of that is to uh, religious institutions, so people giving to their churches. So mm -hmm. um, if you were to take that out, we would be not quite as philanthropic as we sound, but not that giving to churches isn't philanthropic, but it's not the same as giving to hospitals or libraries or other things. Because people, when they're giving to churches, I think they think that Maybe they're going to get to heaven more quickly uh, by, yes. by uh, they're, doing this. They're, you never they're know. buying the afterlife. Okay. <clears throat> Let's be hypothetical for just a second. Let's suppose that Hillary wins the presidency. And afterwards, before she's inaugurated, in between November and January, she calls you up. And she says, David, I want you to form a group, a small group of corporate CEOs of considerable stature and I want you to organize a conversation out of which they can offer me advice about how to address the problem of income inequality in America. Um, my name is not Bernie, but I heard right. what he was saying. Right. Okay. And, um, and in order that Wall Street not take the rap and be a kind of devil, is it possible for the corporate leaders um, to themselves begin to suggest ways in which we can address this problem um, with their advice at the lead? Well, of course, business leaders today are being beat up a fair bit by yeah. the presidential candidates, so I'm not sure our credibility is so wonderful. And if she were to ask me, I would have to say, let's involve many other people who have different perspectives as well and different backgrounds. The problem of income inequality is one of the most pernicious problems we have. And it's not unlike trying to solve the problem of deflation. We know how to solve the problem of inflation. You jack up interest rates and eventually inflation will go down, though there'll be a lot of uh, bad economic times for a while. Deflation is a very pernicious problem. We don't really know how to solve it, and that's why it's scary to a lot of governments, because if you go into the deflationary spiral, you may not be able to get out of it for decades, as Japan has learned. Um, income inequality is something that I think was always a problem in the United States, but it's been exacerbated by the Great Recession. When we came out of the Great Recession in June of 2009, technically, we saw the United States really split in two. Uh, we saw the wealthy people and the, and the corporate CEOs and the hedge fund people and private people getting wealthier and wealthier, and the people uh, who were the bottom part of the economic strata getting less and less wealthy. And part of the thing that is fueling Bernie Sanders' uh, popularity and Donald Trump's is the perception by many people that they have been left behind, that per capita net income is going down, not up. And we're reading about people around the world getting wealthier, and we're not getting wealthier, except for the people at the very top. So not since 1929 have we had such a bad income inequality. So how would I solve it? Well, obviously, if I had the solution, I would have gone to the White House already. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have waited for it to be called by Hillary. There's no simple answer, and nobody has a simple answer. Uh, I'll give you one of the problems that I, I think we have, is, it, is that in our country, we have a very high um, um, illiteracy rate. We, we have 20% of our country's adults are functionally illiterate. 12% are completely illiterate. And if you're illiterate, you have a higher chance of going to the criminal justice system. So 60% of the people who are in jail today or in prison cannot read or write effectively. 
And so when we let people um, drop out of high school or drop out of grade school and don't really get education, we're just fueling this on and on forever. And so what you've got to do is get better K-12 to education. It's amazing that we have the finest uh, private uh, and public uh, higher education system in the world, the envy of the world. Everywhere I go around the world, people don't want my economic advice. They want to know how I can get your, my kid into this school or that school. <laughs> but nobody can ask me about our K-12 to system because it, it's not very, very good. And we have to make it better. We have to educate our people better. But it's a long time coming. I think uh, Larry Summers, among others, would say if we're going to do something about uh, this problem, among other things we have to do is begin to rebuild the infrastructure of our country, create jobs, because mm. the infrastructure, as all of you probably have observed, is crumbling. If any of you have been to airports in Hong Kong, Singapore, or Dubai, you marvel at these wonderful airports. If you go to LaGuardia and you go to Kennedy, you kind of say, is this a third world country? You know, um, I live in Washington, D.C., and every time I see the mayor, I say, what about the potholes? I mean, this mm. is embarrassing. I go to Lagos, Nigeria, and I have better roads there than I have in Washington, <laughs> D.C. So uh, the infrastructure is crumbling. And one of the best ways to get people back to work is to really have a system to rebuild the infrastructure of our country. And it's going to take a long time that could create more jobs. But the problem of income inequality is a very serious problem. But there's one other one that's even worse. And that's the perception of lack of social mobility. In my case, as a, as a mm. person who came from very modest circumstances, I actually believed in the American dream. I thought, get a good education, work hard, you'll, you'll, you'll rise up. And it worked for me. But today, people don't think that's the case anymore. So their ability to rise up from low economic circumstances is, is they don't believe that they can, and therefore they've dropped out. They're giving up. And that's a sad thing, because if you have an underclass in our society and they don't believe they can get uh, better, they're going to go involve, get involved in the legal justice, the criminal justice system. They're going to get involved in drugs. They're going to do kind of things that are not going to make them productive citizens. So it's a sad situation that we have the wealthiest country in the world, but we have very, we have also highest prison population in the world. We're 5% of the world's population. We're 25% of the world's prison population. Uh, it's just unbelievable this is happening, but it is. So what you're saying is there's no magic bullet. I hear you talking, trying to convince your fellow uh, executives about education as something and maybe a, a sort of a GI bill for infrastructure um, in terms of some sort of or Marshall Plan of our own. Um, uh, it's important to me, it seems, that the corporate sector play a role in fashioning a response so that it's not right. perceived as something that, that they perceive that they have, they have stuff in this game. And to, to recover the middle class for the, precisely the reasons you mentioned, because that's what fosters the belief that hard work will lead, and right. even though that's, there's a certain delusional quality to that for a lot of people, it's got to sustain a certain level of credibility in order to permit right. that b belief to continue. The, the, the strength of this country, among other things, we have a great legal system, we have a great political system, so forth and so on, was we had a very strong middle class. Yes. The middle class is now um, crumbling in yeah. many ways. People don't feel they're in the middle class, and people at the upper stratas don't know what it is to be in the middle class. So, uh, for example, uh, mm. When President Obama, who's a very intelligent person and, and, and means well and does some great things, when he ran for president, for whatever reason, he said, I'm not going to tax the middle class. I'm not going to increase taxes on the middle class. So if you make $250,000 or, or, or less, you're, you're protected. Okay, fine. He thought everybody who made $250,000 was middle class. Turns out middle class at that time was $65,000. <laughs> so in effect, if, you know, uh, only 2% of the people in America at the time that he was elected made more than $250,000. But many of the people he knew and met were people who he thought were in the middle class. He thought they were, you know, $250,000 middle class, but it was actually smaller. And the middle class today for family of four is probably $75,000. And not a lot of people who are corporate CEOs or people making uh, major economic decisions know a lot of people like this. And the amazing thing that's happened in Washington now, and the reason that the media elites, the, the uh, uh, television elites, the economic elites, and others missed what was happening in the campaign was none of them actually knew people who were mm. in the lower middle class, and they weren't talking to them. So when Donald Trump became very popular, Bernie Sanders became very popular, it's because they were being, uh, they were being uh, voted upon and, and favored by people that the people in Washington weren't talking to. So that's why everybody was so amazed what happened, because the people don't know the, the problems that some of the lower middle class people have, or the, the, uh, the economic underclass. Um, and it's really been a shock to people in Washington. I'm not sure they still get it. And, it's, and, and the, what, whoever wins the election is going to have to deal with the fact that you've got a big disaffected part of the population, and it's not going to go away once the election's behind us. Not all of a sudden people aren't going to go back and say, 
I'm just not going to do anything about the fact that I, my candidate lost. They're going to uh, try to change the government in other ways, and it, it's going to be a, a revolutionary period at times in certain respects in terms of how people re relate to their government. For all that you've done to help Americans think about their own history and provide a leadership on, in your generation on the giving side, personal thanks, and I think all of us want to thank him too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, well, thank you for uh, thank you very much, and Joe, thank you for what you've done. Because my theory has been that if people um, learn more about history, they will um, not repeat some of the mistakes, and if they um, you know are, are excited to learn about history. Um, they can get inspired to become good citizens themselves. And so your books, uh, I think I've read virtually all of them, are, are great inspiration for people. And I thank you for all the work that you've done for our country as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.